is uh, Brenda Platt with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm based in DC and I'll be your moderator today. This is um, this webinar is our first huddle by invitation only for community composters. And today we're going to be providing a short overview of the legal and policy trends we see impacting each stage of the composting process from collection through composting all the way to distribution of compost. Um, and we'll be particularly looking at policy and legal issues that you may be facing, uh, whether it's zoning, franchise agreements, insurance, permitting, and more. So what we're going to do today is um, we're going to do some introductions to our team. We're going to introduce this new partnership between the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the Sustainable Economies Law Center and the goals of this. And then we're going to uh, hear um, some uh, outline an overview of what these legal and policy issues are. Uh, Virginia Streeter, uh, my colleague, who's the coordinator for the Community Composting Coalition, will share some of the brief findings of the survey, thanks to all of you who participated on what your key obstacles and issues are. And then we're going to have a short panel to kind of kick off our discussion. We've picked uh, three community composters from around the country. We'll introduce them in a few minutes. And we've asked them to share with us some of their challenges, how they've been dealing with them, and um, some suggestions. And then we'll leave almost close to an hour of, up to discussion and next steps. So um, before we get started, uh, we're going to do a few quick polls just to see who's on the line. So Nick, if we could start with the first poll of where are you, that would be great. So gives a second to So select from where you are. Are people able to do that? If there's any issues and you're not seeing it, let us know. In the chat window, you can communicate. Looks like, OK. Close the poll. Ah, 60% uh, East Coast, some West Coast, not too much in the Southeast and Southwest, OK. Next question, who's on the line in terms of what sector you're from? Select all that apply. All right, 78% voted. We still 83%. Let's see if we can get to 100. So close. All right, we'll go with 83% voting. All right. Oh. Two-thirds for-profit, a few worker-owned cooperatives, bike haulers, a little more than a third nonprofit. Great. Good, good representation, I think. And then the last question is just to get a sense if you're already operating uh, a community enterprise or you're interested in starting one, um, so just or other, just so we can sense if you're already working on this or you're thinking about it. Okay. All right, we've got a higher per participation in this one. 94% participated, and most folks are already operating it, but we have some that are interested in starting. Um, and I'll be interested in learning from those of you who put other what, um, uh, what, where you are. So maybe when we open up the line, keep in mind, maybe you could share. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Nick. Um, so what I want to introduce is the, the project and the partnership between the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the um, Sustainable Economies Law Center, which is based in Oakland, California. And we recently got a grant to start this project from the Lisa um, and Douglas Goldman Fund, and we are partnering to support proactively the community composting movement to help community composters navigate the legal and policy terrain. And there's some specific things we are hoping to establish in this coming year. Um, and, and 
some products we are looking to help fill the current gaps in training, resources, best management practices, and other critical legal support. Um, Nick, I'm not seeing the next slide, so just to let you know, it's not showing up on my screen yet. Um, there we go, partnership goals. So one of the first things we're doing is we're surveying and inventorying your needs. So, and Virginia, as I mentioned earlier, will be sharing some of the preliminary results of the survey, but this is organic. So as more issues come up, just an open invitation to let us know about that and hear about that. Um, some of the things we're hoping to develop this year in terms of legal resources and training for you all is including a legal guide to community composting or here, you know, people's quick guide to compost law and policy. We'd like to get some input on what you'd like to be included in that. We have our own ideas. That was part of the survey. Um, one of our goals is to establish a, uh, a network of volunteers and hopefully pro bono lawyers who can help provide some rapid response legal services to community compost organizations. Um, the Community Compost and Policy Roadmap, listed as number three here, we hope will be a guide to help local advocates and policymakers on best practices in policy. Um, and we are also uh, going to be starting um, a subcommittee of the Community Composting Coalition to focus on policy. And we hope anybody who's really interested in these issues will roll up their sleeves and and join that in Virginia, maybe at the end of your remarks, if we have a date for the first call, you can let people know when that is, um, which I think will be in the next next few weeks. So um, let me just introduce the team. So next slide, Nick and Janelle, you know, please say a few words from the Sustainable Economies Law Center and introduce your team. Hi everybody, this is Janelle and from Sustainable Economies Law Center, there's actually four staff and one uh, contractor, collaborator, Courtney Brown, who you're about to meet. Um, but yeah, we have various staff who have been involved in compost law and policy at different points over the years and we've just come to learn, particularly because so many composters reach out to us, just how many layers and layers there are of different local, state and other laws that that we need to be learning about and that now is the time to be learning about them. So some of my coworkers can't be on this, uh, Sue Bennett, we also have Cameron Rudy and Christina Oatfield involved. Um, but our goal is to just learn as much as we possibly can this year, share as much as we possibly can and, um, and create as many resources and potentially do with some policy advocacy uh, in collaboration with all of you. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. Um, so let's, and then in the next slide, I'll just introduce the, the panel we, we have, which will follow. Uh, Courtney Brown will do, uh, will do the overview of um, some of the issues facing us, and I'll introduce her in a minute. But the panel, Sarah Batwala Messina at Inca, at Inca Small Earth is in San Diego, Java, and Michelle Bradley at Java's uh, Compost is, are in New Jersey, Phil Westcott, um, and by the way, uh, Matt, um, uh, we'll be joining them, a pro bono lawyer, talking for a few minutes on, on the issues that with Java Bradley. Phil Westcott um, with Key City Compost is in Frederick, Maryland. And we've asked uh, each of these uh, kind of panelists to just give us, answer these three questions. What are your legal policy challenges, your big ones? How have you addressed these? And what do you need to overcome these? And how can this coalition, this movement, and this and ILSR and, and the Law Center particularly best help you with the products we want to do. So we thought some real on the ground stories can help ground our conversation today. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Courtney Brown, who's going to uh, lead us off on a summary of uh, what are the key issues facing community composters. And Courtney, as Janelle just mentioned, is going to is a contractor, but Courtney is the founder and director of a nonprofit, Common Compost, also in Oakland. And uh, she founded Compost, uh, Common Compost in Oakland as a way to realize the efficiency and benefits of composting with worms at a community scale, at an urban scale. But she's not going to be talking about that business, so you have to click on her link so uh, to find out more about what Courtney does. But today she's going to give us a quick overview of some of these issues. So Courtney, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Brenda. Um, 
I am really excited to be able to talk to you guys today about compost law and policy. And I know for most it can be a pretty arduous or boring task, but I actually find it really exciting and I want to try to instill some of this excitement in you guys. Um, so besides what Brenda mentioned, um, I am also a co-founding member and on the steering committee for a group we put together in California called the California Alliance for Community Composting. And what we're working to do is to ensure the viability of having a sector, a community composting sector in California that can be supplemental to more large scale facilities. Um, and especially a decentralized um, sort of system in California that um, really focuses on keeping this resource local. Um, and as Brenda mentioned and Janelle mentioned, I'm also volunteering with Sustainable Economies Law Center right now to try to come up with policy roadmaps that um, would be helpful knowledge sharing resources for you guys on a national level. Um, I w do want to make it clear I did this presentation in Atlanta um, in January and afterwards I got a lot of comments of, um, oh, you're such a great lawyer, but I just want to make it really clear I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I come to this with a background in policy, um, international environmental policy work, and then comp common compost or community compost and worm composting is a passion project for me um, because we deal with um, a lot of legal barriers in Oakland. We're not actually a nonprofit right now, so I just wanted to correct that just quickly too. We're a pilot program um, and some of these barriers that we're about to discuss in this presentation I can go to in more depth during the question and answer if you have specific questions for me. Um, but anyway, let's get started. So next slide, Nick. <clears throat> Yay, laws. Um, Sustainable Economies Law Center created a program on compost law and policy because multiple times um, they would host their legal advice clinics and community members would come in with asking a very simple question. I'd like to start a small neighborhood project or a micro enterprise to recover food waste and compost it. Is there anything I need to know about the law? And as it turns out, the Sustainable Economies Law Center found out there are so many things you need to know about the law and multiple areas of the law for composting. And that even so, there's more variation from city to city and state to state in what those laws are. So, um, and that not only that there are laws and that they're changing in different areas, but that they are constantly updated. So this is a really big moving target. And so I know that it sounds overwhelming, um, but we're gonna give you the tools to kind of be able to break that down and to go through how that might be relevant or relatable to you in your area. So next slide. So while there's a good deal of variation happening from place to place, the, the trend right now is that a lot of municipalities are um, really looking to uh, reach out um, to a large scale hauler that can handle everything. Um, and it could easily become widespread, um, this sort of big waste buying up cities, if our community compost movement is not a little bit more proactive. Um, the privilege to large scale haulers and large composting facilities um, somehow makes sense in the intentionality of, the, of, of a city. Um, just in handling pure volume, but what we have seen is that the um, landfill diversion mandates that kind of push cities into looking for these large-scale haulers um, are uh, actually going to need every different portion along the spectrum from backyard composting all the way through large-scale facilities in order to meet these really ambitious um, landfill diversion goals by 2025, summer 2035, and whatnot. So, next slide. What we have done, um, just given the sheer overwhelming nature of compost law, is that we've started to dividing the laws and policies into two major categories to help see how not only states and cities, but you and I should be looking at these as well. So first, there are many types of laws that are designed to protect communities. 
um, air and water quality, potential nuisances, pollution threats, odors um, that can result from a poorly managed compost project. And then the other set of laws are designed to help communities scale up their composting programs and meet their ambitious goals. So these are more planning laws. But both protective laws and planning processes pose challenge to small scale composting projects, mainly because both are often written with only a large scale composting system in mind. So next slide. So these two major categories of laws, um, under protection, you're mainly going to find things that are um, would be under zoning ordinances or would be very much down to the local level, um, but have overarching state level policies which guide municipalities in this way. And the same with planning. Problem with the challenge for community composters is that they create a series of permits, inspections, fees, especially on the protection side, which become very onerous um, for a community scale project to not only afford, but to jump through all of these hurdles. On the planning side, most of the people who are invited to the table, to the planning table, are actually, um, uh, uh, they're not really reaching out to this very small scale and decentralized projects. Um, that They'll really just bring the large scale waste haulers and stakeholders to the table. So there's incredible opportunity here in these protection and planning. Um, most laws are also available online um, if you wanted to start to go into these two different categories, um, depending on where you think that you're having the most bottleneck or the most problem for you. Uh, the legal research roadmap, um, which is a handout which will be available later today for you guys, is you could take it and look at it as sort of a chart, um, get together with friends, have a legal research party or what we call like a legal hackathon um, to research what kind of laws are in your area, how they may be affecting you. Um, and if you need extra support and help in that, please feel free to reach out for us um, to us as well. So next slide. Um, we found that there are four kind of major areas of the law, depending on where you are in the composting process. Um, so let's start with where waste is generated. Um, and we have a somewhat bewildered looking cartoon here. His name is Carrot Top. Um, and he's going to walk us through the process of what it's like to uh, work with a community composter. Um, so here uh, with with uh, compost generation, um, a lot of the laws here are for the sake of the aesthetics, the health and the environment around the rules that govern where you can dump compost. So the dumpsters, the bins, what form they take, where they're placed, whether or not you can see them from the street, how often they're emptied. Um, and something really important to keep in mind here um, is that community composters may not be able just to go pick up a bucket that's located on someone's front porch or a restaurant that sat it out onto the sidewalk, um, even though you'll be there in 10 minutes um, because it needs to be in a sealable locked container or it can only be out on the street for less than 24 hours and only on Tuesdays. Or So it's really something to start here. We've got to start with um, wh who's generating the waste and how are they actually storing it until you get to it. Next slide. Oh, and just a quick caveat on the generators and the planning side. A lot of this is to support or encourage the generator to participate in source set separation. So on the planning policies, it's more about where the generator can no longer throw vegetative or any compostables into the trash. Um, so the slide on haulers. Again, breaking this down into protection and planning. The question now comes to who can collect and haul compostable material. Um, community composters, this 
in my situation, especially here in Oakland and California, we'd love, cannot wait to hear from what the rest of you guys are, are um, challenges you might be dealing with. But this presents the biggest hurdle of all because the trend of cities is to contract with a large scale hauler, offer them an exclusive franchise, which is basically a monopoly and exclusive rights to any material that is protrusible waste or solid waste, whether or not it was actually put in a bin um, that is owned by these large scale haulers to take it away. So really a lot of compost hauling and the law and policy this goes much further beyond the concept of what is waste, but to who owns the waste and at what point they own the waste that has been generated. Um, and um, who can pick it up and take it anywhere and where they can take it to. So the protection parts um, are really to protect the large scale hauler industry interests. Um, the planning parts are to design um, a solid waste management system which can deal with not only the volume and the capacity in that jurisdiction but that it goes to things um, to it, it, it stays out of landfills or it does not get disposed of in any way. So next slide. Composting. So there's the question of where and how composting can be done. Both the state composting facilities deal with a lot of um, the same licensing laws and local zoning laws that community composters have to navigate. So although there are laws which can in some instances be separated out into tiers based by size, depending on how you can do these processes, for the most part, it is the same across the board. Um, in addition, there's also a variety of health and environmental laws um, that can be enforced by multiple agencies like air and water quality districts. Um, and sometimes these laws have clear exemptions for us or for vermicomposting, for example, or certain methodologies. But other times, the permits and the laws are far too burdensome for small scale com composters to justify the expense of paying for them. And most of the subsidies to support the development of these composting sites is often only offered to larger scale facilities. So this can be also a really big impetus in the revenue uh, margins um, in which you're able to create for your enterprise. Uh, so next slide. So finally, if Carrot Top can successfully navigate all the laws governing bins, hauling, and the facilities, and it alas becomes a reborn as a rich soil, now where can that soil actually go? What bag can you put it in? And what can you put on the label of the bag? These are all um, laws in which you will have to explore as well. In some places, these laws are designed to ensure that there is truthful labeling to fertilizers. So again, that's the protection side of it. Um, and then for the planning sides of it, they um, want to make sure that uh, final compostable material on site and the volume of that and the movement of that and how it is sold in bulk or in, in small bags for retail or for direct distribution. Does it get used on site? Does it get used in a cooperative of agricultural sites? And so these are all laws that will determine where it can go after you've made it. Um, so this can be a good thing if it gives us the opportunity to show that we're producing really good dirt um, by testing and labeling, um, especially if it is superior quality, this craft compost that we're making over the type of compost that the large scale industries are pushing out. So I think that this is a really good area to show uh, the value added, not only of our final products, but of the work that we're doing. So. Um, and then on the second end, as far as um, the planning process goes, it could be another added cost for these labeling um, certifications and then the testing fees uh, on a frequency level that just doesn't really match up with the total capacity that we're dealing with on a weekly, a monthly, or even an annual basis. Um, so they're also designed not really to take this small scale efforts into account. All right. Next slide. So this will be discussed a little bit later uh, from one of our panelists, um, Sarah from San Diego. Uh, but we have had some members of our California Alliance for Community Composting actually successfully navigate and overcome 
very difficult barriers. Those were facility permitting, zoning approvals, labeling laws, and hauling prohibitions. So I'm not going to steal the thunder from her, but give her an opportunity to really talk about a lot of the hard work that she's put in. So next slide. So basically, given the many challenges for community composters, there are a lot of laws and policies that we need to either change and amend, or we need to outright create. Um, and importantly, right now is that time to do it. So policy adv advocates will often refer to something which is called a policy window. And a policy window opens when you have a convergence of three different things. That is widespread recognition of and a concern about a problem, a viable policy solution to that problem, and a political mood interest in tackling the issue. So if you go to policy school, they generally tell you that these policy windows are somewhat rare and that it's really hard to change uh, laws that are already in motion. But when it comes to composting, quite likely, policy windows are opening or about to open all over the place because nationally we are starting to have a widespread recognition of the concern for food waste ending up in landfills um, and that there are states creating mandates for landfill diversion. So there's a policy solution there. And then the political mood right now is where we really come in. Um, it gives us an opportunity to express that it's small scale and there is a role for small scale and decentralized systems in reaching um, landfill diversion goals. And the problems that we've been having with in California is that these processes really kind of sneak up on us, these policy windows. So it's really important to be able to be ready um, to act in very short periods of time and to be able to be active stakeholders at any policy discussion that's happening, whether or not that is over a specific law and a bill, which is um, going to get passed. And oftentimes there are just stakeholder workshops in which they want to know your opinion. Um, and that, that is a really important policy window as well. Uh, next slide. So a few examples of the policy windows that we've been uh, that we've been able to have in California are uh, right now um, the state agency uh, for recycling and recovery, which is called CalRecycle, is implementing a bill which creates the rules and the programs to reduce methane um, emissions from landfills. A lot of this bill is going to deal with the responsibility of cities in California to divert their organic material for landfills. So for us to show up at these and ask the state to make more encouraging capacity planning um, language in the bill that will have a city look to community composters to provide supplemental activity to get this organic material out of the landfills is something we really need support as a top-down process from the state. So our alliance has been very active in um, submitting comments uh, to, uh, to change and to amend SB 1383. There are a few other random bills too here and there that have popped up but have never actually been passed. Um, so and we'd like to hope that a lot of that happened to do with the influence that we were able to give the committees at the time about why it would be detrimental to our industry or not really support the overarching waste diversion goals of the state as a whole. Um, so the, another option is municipal bid seeking and contract processes. Um, San Diego, Sacramento and LA are going through this right now. Um, we not only give input on legislation, but to actually spearhead legislation. Um, uh, two years ago, um, we drafted a community composting act um, to carve out protections for micro composters and micro enterprises that would otherwise um, not be excluded under these ex uh, franchise agreements. However, it didn't go anywhere, but Getting, I mean, when I mean that, we didn't get an author to um, actually sponsor the bill to bring it to the floor. So there is could be another policy window in the future, or you could actually get on your own soap, soapbox and become a legislator yourself. Uh, seek appointments to local and state waste and recycling commissions. Um, find this is a very valuable way, especially at the local level, to become a player in the game. Next slide. 
Uh, and so it's important that we think of ourselves, the composters, as the policymakers who do this work. Uh, I think it's important to remember that lawyers don't learn about compost in law school. Um, and politicians don't get elected because they know about compost. We need to look at ourselves here as the experts who are best positioned to be the policy makers in these situations. And a lot of us are used to weighing in on policy issues by signing, say, peti a petitions here or there, voting on ballot initiatives. But what we actually need to be doing right now is actively writing the legislative proposals and spearheading the campaigns on how we think that compost policy and law should take place in our communities. Um, because it's not being done right now who by people who are experts in this subject or people who have the same social benefit and social repurposing in mind that we do um, and don't see maybe the economic value of a decentralized small-scale composting industry so the, it's an opportunity to educate people if not actually influence policy itself next slide I'll just go over this one really quickly. Uh, something that we've been doing in a, as an approach here in Oakland is starting soil policy teams. So we recruited a team of eight urban farmers who meet about once a month and we do fun team building activities. We provide trainings on compost law and policy in that deal with just the city of Oakland. And then we see where that takes us. We get into conversations and the rabbit holes have been so wonderful. Um, and we're hoping that this group will um, actively begin poking its head in many policy windows here in California, but also in Oakland. I mean, it's just an example in our upcoming um, policy party later this month. We have a member from the city of Oakland's Department of Sanitation um, that is uh, going to come participate and come and talk to us. Uh, so it's kind of a casual but really open door opportunity to build relationships with your council members in your own city or other relevant policymakers. So next slide. Um, basically, we're doing just those two things in our community compost movement. We're thinking, what are the way that we can be best advocates for our situation right now? In the Oakland example, but this could apply, I think, in a lot of situations across the US, is that we need to come up with a shared definition of what is community composting. Is that composting cooperative, community micro composting, community micro haulers? I mean, there's a whole gambit and a list of definitions that we haven't really um, worked out or actually successfully gotten into some of our state local policy. And there have been um, a lot of past work done on this, not only through the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and through the Sustainable Economies Law Center of trying to get input on what that makes sense, but nothing have we brought at a state level had felt um, that uh, it, it has encompassed everything in the work that our industry does. And so there's room for fleshing this out a little bit more um, and also room to get it into active bills that are going through um, committees right now. Also adopting best management practices. This is something that we do at the Cultivating Community Composting Workshop. So I know it's something that you're all aware of, but maybe it's not something that your municipal councils are aware that you have or that you abide by. Just sharing that information with them can build a lot of confidence in the practices for what we're actually trying to do here. Next slide. Other approaches for advocacy are really simple. You can ask for exemptions that are already common in the law and then generally apply to activities that have a nonprofit or a social benefit purpose. So we would qualify for them. Uh, tiered levels of laws we've seen in the compost industry work really well so that something that's applied to large scale capacities is not the same thing that's applied to small scale capacities. Now, how we define what is exactly small scale, again, there's room for improvement there, or however it is relevant in your community. Um, that may not be something that could be blanketed across the board. A rights-based advocacy approach is to establish the right for not only backyard composting, but community gardens, um, homeowners associations, uh, closed campus, commercial campuses, um, that people who have their own land and produce and generate their own waste and may hit a volume threshold still should have a basic right to do this backyard composting, quote unquote, if they're meeting certain you know, best management practices or whatever the um, restraints are from 
the city, and then incentives, loan assistance program. And then these last two slides, I'll just go through really quickly um, because uh, I think that it just shows the it will kind of lead discussion on where uh, the middle part of the spectrum still needs to be addressed. So overall, community composting has a lot to discuss, and we have discussed a lot so far. But the diversity of approaches, particularly as we recognize this on a spectrum, um, is where a lot of these legal uh, issues become gray areas. And I know a lot of everybody continues on anyway in these legal gray areas, but um, really is an opportunity for policymakers to start grappling with these gray areas, um, just so that it's clear and we can make the certain investments we need in our social enterprise to feel confident that once we start what we're doing, we could scale that and it wouldn't be shut down if we hit another sort of capacity level or another area, another gray area. Um, next slide. And so perhaps what we need to do is create another access um, between large scale and backyard composting, but maybe projects that are structured for this community benefit um, or it's stakeholder oriented versus structured for profit or it's shareholder oriented. Um, and a few examples of who would fall in those kind of different quadrants and should the laws and policies be designed around this uh, stakeholder versus shareholder orientation. Um, so we're looking for just some feedback on that. This is a general idea we have, but nothing that's kind of set in stone. Um, in the final slide, uh, let us discuss during this discussion to uh, today, I think that we're really interested in what policy issues are coming up for you guys or the legal issues or the legal and policy resources that you would find most helpful um, so that we can start working together. Um, that's the Sustainable Economies Law Center and ILSR to create these resources for you. Um, and then also keeping it positive. Do you have any favorite laws, any laws that are working for you? Um, positive outlooks, positive experiences you've gone through, successful wins in the policy arena. Um, I think that sharing that would be not only motivating, but help others learn how to be successful from you. So I'll turn it back over to Virginia and Brenda. Yes, thank you, Courtney. And really while appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Round of applause for you. So um, while we're bringing up Virginia's, I think that's a good lead in the questions because we did a survey. Uh, Virginia can share with us how many of you participated um, and what your key issues were. And I'll just say to Courtney, your point about the time is now and, and the importance of, of raising the awareness of the problem and presenting viable solutions. That's exactly what we want to be getting to is legitimizing community composters in the eyes of policymakers and other stakeholders and raising the overall profile of the sector, showing we're legitimate. And then again, the flip side is also we want to reduce the likelihood that new community or micro composting projects are going to fail for legal reasons. So I think um, that was spot on. So Virginia, I'm going to hand it over to you to summarize the results of the survey. Virginia Streeter, again, for those of you who joined uh, late, is um, coordinating the Community Composting Coalition. And she's my colleague at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Great. Uh, thank you, Brenda. Um, so. A few weeks ago, we sent out um, a survey um, trying to sort of gather more information on you all and what your operations look like and what kind of issues you're facing. Um, so I'm just going to briefly share sort of the landscape of um, the type of community composters that we have in our coalition and um, the issues. So Nick, if you could go to the next slide. So um, this is just an overview of um, who responded. We got 24 total responses. Um, 13 of those were for-profit, eight non-profit, and then we had um, like a social cooperative, informal volunteer groups, and sort of an other category. Um, and then 21 of the 24 were are collecting and composting, so we're dealing with all the issues uh, that Courtney just talked about in terms of hauling and composting and everything. And then two are just composting only. Um, and then one is an uh, organization working to support community composters in their area. Um, and 
five um, were bike haulers. Um, the rest were using trucks or vans. Um, and just a quick shout out to the bike haulers. We have a bike hauling subcommittee that meets once a month. Um, and it's a really great group. So if you are a bike hauler and you want to be tied in to um, sort of the bike hauling community, uh, please let me know. Um, OK, so then we had uh, sort of an array of states that responded. Um, I'm not going to read those all off, but uh, see mostly East Coast and California. Um, and then a really wide range of material being collected. Um, so. For collectors, um, it ranged from 60 to 2,500 pounds a week, um, although the majority of collectors were collecting um, under 1,000 pounds a week. So there were only, I think, two that were collecting more than 2,000 pounds. Um, and then in addition to collecting, some are also receiving material to site um, different ways, whether drop off or something like that. Um, and so that was a range of 35 to uh, 7,500 pounds of material um, being received at a uh, site or sites each week. Um, although again, the majority were under 1,000 pounds a week. Um, so next slide. Um, and so this is just a breakdown of um, the square footage of composting area. So um, most composters, uh, that responded to the survey have over um, 750 square feet dedicated to um, their composting operation. Um, and we asked this because uh, a number of states or include um, sort of composting areas, part of their regulations and what category you fit into. So wanted to get an idea of um, what kind of sizes we are looking at for you all. Um, next slide. Um, and then we asked uh, what type of workers. So options we gave were full-time employees, part-time employees, volunteers, or other. Um, and so part-time employees, volunteers were most common. Um, seven organizations have full-time employees. Um, and just to be clear, this chart is um, on the survey. You could select all that apply. So. Uh, this isn't only seven have only full-time employees um, the combination and then the other included um like advisory committees and things like that um that they that organizations are considering part of kind of their workforce uh next slide um and so then this is the distribution of um what types of workers each organization has so six organizations have volunteers only um, uh, one organization had volunteers part-time and full-time. Um, only two organizations have full-time only. Um, yeah, so just a breakdown of kind of what combination of workers um, the respondents have. Uh, next slide. And then we also asked about material generators. Um, so almost everyone was collecting from residential. Uh, there's just one organization that is collecting just from um, vendors at a farmer's market. Um, and then the majority of organizations are collecting um, from a combination of residential and some other sector. Um, and again, there were seven sort of other categories. So that include farms, farmers markets, and then a few collecting from parties um, and events. Uh, so next slide. Um, and so this is how many different types of generators that the organizations are collecting from. Um, so I mentioned there's one, gener one organization collecting from just farmers market vendors. Um, and then there's also one organization collecting from just residential. So there are only two respondents um, that have only one generator. Uh, and the mo most were collecting from a combination of two different types of generators um, and then three or four types of generators. Um, right, next slide. 
Um, so sort of comparing what the workforce looks like versus what kind of generators um, these organizations are collecting from. Um, so six organizations are collecting from all four of the types we listed, which was residential, commercial, institutional, and on-site. Uh, of those six organiza organizations, four have full-time workers and two have part-time workers. Uh, none of those six are volunteer only. Um, so just thought this was interesting to see um, what kind of workforce is required in order to be operating at that scale that you're collecting from that many different types of generators. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, one organization is collecting residential only, um, and they're collecting full-time, or they have full-time, part-time, and volunteer workers. And this was the only organization uh, with full-time employees that was collecting from only one type of generator. Um, so every other organization that has full-time workers uh, has at least two generators that they're collecting from. Okay. Virginia, this is Brenda. Sorry to interject, but we're you, uh, if you could just, I think people will have these slides to see who was included. If you could just skip ahead to the policy part, I think that's what we need to do now. I think okay. we have a sense of the workers. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, um, so we asked uh, what the biggest problems everyone was facing. Um, these were the seven problems we listed. Uh, this is an order of sort of most, or most organizations um, facing this problem to a least number of organizations. Um, but there was really, it, it was all pretty uh, close. Um, so, for instance, uh, composters, um, three composters said they had major problems with insurance coverage, and seven they ha said they had um, some problems with insurance coverage. Um, but all the rest of these problems listed um, all had composters with either major or some problems um, that they faced. Um, and so next slide. Um, and then for we also asked for haulers um, about the biggest problems they're facing. Um, and these were the six categories we broke hauler problems out into. And again, insurance coverage um, was the biggest issue, but um, really all of these are issues. Um, so this is in order, um, but we it was pretty clear from the survey that um, all of these are pretty important issues that we need to work on. Um, okay, and then last slide. Um, so then we also asked what the most important um, legal and policy topics and resources are. Um, so majority of composters wanted to see um, resources regarding enterprise structure um, and licensing. Um, and so this is again in order, um, but I mean, these were, even closer than the biggest problems in terms of um, the importance that uh, respondents placed on them. Uh, we asked to like rank from not a priority to uh, top priority, um, but yeah, they're all important. Um, so yeah, so basically we learned from the survey that um, a lot of issues that we need to work on um, and we have some polling questions after this uh, regarding um, these issues to try to get a sense from the people on this call who may not have uh, in, be able, been able to participate in the survey, what issues they're facing. So, great, thank you. Thanks, Virginia, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We were just getting to the policies, it was like your very next slide. So, um, so I think what we're gonna do, we have an, an hour and eight minutes. Um, I hope folks can stay on for the whole time. We, we have enough time for discussion. So we're gonna get right into um, our panel discussion. And we're gonna start off with um, Phil Westcott at Key City Compost in Frederick, Maryland. And, um, and again, and then it's gonna be followed by Sarah Boltwana Messina from Aninka Small Earth in San Diego, and then with uh, Java Bradley and um, and um, and Matt Carmel at Riker Danzig's Environmental Law Group, uh, 
uh, Java's in West Orange, Matt's in Morristown, New Jersey, a uh, pro bono lawyer working with him. So again, we're going to have um, a few minutes for each of these groups to talk about what the key policy legal challenges are, how they address them, and what their biggest needs are that we, the movement, or uh, experts can help them with. And then what we'll do is, um, if, if you want to have a question, you can, of course, tap it into uh, the go to uh, webinar control panel, or uh, you can put your hand up, and then we'll unmute you, and you can ask your question during the discussion. So begin to think about um, uh, um, think about some of the issues you want to bring up. So Sarah, uh, you're asking, and for Phil, and uh, Java, and Matt, how much time you should talk. So if each of your stories, we budgeted about five to eight minutes. So you know, the less time you speak, the more time we'll have for, for questions. So um, Phil, we're going to start with you. So Nick, if um, you could um, unmute Phil. That would be great. All right. Can everybody hear me? At yes, least? we can hear okay. you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will skip over uh, a long and lengthy bio and just kind of tell you a tiny bit about uh, what Key City Compost is. We we started about a year and a half, maybe a tiny bit less, uh, a year and a half ago, and. Uh, we do residential and commercial. We started as residential. Uh, I was working on a farm part time and used that relationship with the farm to, to process compost on uh, that farmland at a very, very small kind of under the radar capacity. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, and it you know, I, I took a class with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, the uh, Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders course. And so I knew quite a bit about composting. That's why I got into it. But I didn't know all of the zoning issues, all of the markets issues, the hauling, all of these things. I kind of just jumped in and figured I'd, I'd, I'd learn it as I, as I went. And that's very much what we've, what we've experienced. Uh, so at the beginning, we were processing all of that material with pitchfork by hand uh, on on farm property, and an article came out. Uh, and and I'm I'm going to be speaking mostly about my experience in in zoning and policy. And through that, I'll tell a quick story about uh, what we've experienced so far. So when we first started, we had a feature article in our local newspaper, and that kind of kicked everything off. Uh, you can do whatever you want when it comes to policy until someone finds out. And that article was definitely uh, what heightened the awareness of, of our process uh, that we were composting. Uh, we, we had specified that we were doing it uh, on a small piece of agricultural land in the county. Uh, we got a call from local uh, zoning administrators uh, asking about, you know, our land use, what it was zoned, the plat numbers, all those kind of questions. And, and I made a friend there, uh, and he, he was very nice because we were so tiny. Uh, I don't think he was really concerned about it. And I was, I was upfront about what our dreams were. And after that, I got fairly educated in the policies behind composting. Uh, mostly because I had to, because I didn't understand the questions that I was being asked. I needed, uh, I needed to express some kind of confidence. And we held a compost summit. And that was our event that was meant to bring the community at large out to hear, uh, well, to speak together and hear from a bunch of presenters on composting. And the county executive showed up. Zoning was not there, actually. But uh, county exec represented zoning. Uh, so the county executive previous years had put together a steering committee to try and address uh, our expensive and externalized landfilling. Our landfill in county is, is capped. It's, that's a, a very long story, but there's some pressure there for the county to get into composting. So that's why they came out to this summit because they have vested interest in this as well. Uh, they thought that they had an exemption on the books I expose that they did not. The exemption said that you basically have to get rezoned for a landfill, and that goes up for vote, and there's a fee. 
that sounds like permitting process to me. They call it an exemption, but it wasn't. So I had met with the uh, zoning administrators and uh, and actually a dear, dear friend of ours had introduced us to the director of planning and zoning. And we had expressed all of you know the things that especially that Courtney had had highlighted about uh, the tiered process and the exemption. Those were the two things that we were pushing for. Uh, we got lucky that we had identified those. Uh, looking back on it, I was very fortunate to have ILSR to lean on. But the exemption process at the state says 5,000 square feet, yet our county does not observe it. And I saw that as a, a huge problem and the county was kind of unaware in a way because no one had applied for this before. So I met with zoning and it asked for tiers in the composting uh, kind of scaling process when it comes to zoning. Uh, and what what really I'd learned the most from that process, we still were, they chose to formally adopt the 5,000 square foot zoning ordinance the exemption for 5,000 square feet. If you are under 5,000 square feet, you are uh, not required to apply for a, a permit or rezoning or any of that. And the language that that I had learned came from that summit and from neighboring counties representatives that had successfully pushed this forward in, in neighboring counties. And, and the term that was very important to me was beneath regulatory concern. And so, what I would like to highlight is some of the things that I had to learn that really helped me forward in that. For one, it was obviously uh, make a lot of friends and, and I did not do pretty much any of this. I just kind of became a, a stakeholder and allowed others that were passionate to, to kind of have, uh, n could move forward knowing that there was someone in their community with skin in the game that really wanted to change our landfill practices and our, our waste practices, compost practices locally. So those friends had pushed for meetings with zoning ordinance. And that was the biggest lesson is that there was already a community mobilized and ready to go. And once I started to meet these individuals from the recycling world, from uh, the Sierra Club, these were folks that educated me a lot and went to bat for me locally. Uh, like I said, I didn't push a lot of this. I just kind of found a community that was ready and educated them on, on composting. So one of the core things I had to learn was the uh, zoning land use table. It's a lot like bingo. If, if your ag, it's just a cross pattern uh, kind of table. It's a, a XY table. And if your ag and you want to do compost, you fit into this. If, if there's an X, you can do it. If there isn't, you can't. And so I, I be, I got familiar with that land use table, and I think that's critical in talking to local policymakers. Uh, and then learning how to find uh, the Maryland code book and how to navigate it. Uh, and I looked for agricultural sections, and I stayed up super late reading these sections, and I think that's probably the best thing you can do. I found that the zoning office had little knowledge of the agricultural sections as it applied to compost before we got involved. And this makes sense because I was the first in our in our county to really push for this. So they had no need to research this stuff before I started uh, bugging them. So being educated on this was, was quite easy, but it was mandatory in order for me to push forward and to uh, educate some of my uh, community members as well as policymakers. Uh, the definitions are at the beginning of each chapter, and in those uh, codes, you, you'll see if you get into them, many on this webinar probably know, perhaps even better than I, what those look like. But those definitions are important because compost was linked in with solid waste. So we couldn't talk about compost without talking about mixed solid waste, and that's a huge problem. So as we started to work on these definitions, on what compost is, what solid waste is, what mixed solid waste is. Uh, those definitions are good to know. It's nice to know where your county, like what the what the words really mean at the at the uh, legal level. And so that was on the state side, and I did the very same for the county side. And I think that that's uh, that was a big surprise to me that the county had different ordinances than the state. Even though the state had an exemption, the county didn't didn't recognize it, didn't support it. 
uh, so that that was that was the biggest hurdle for me was uh, trying things that I thought were legal in my region uh, were actually not available to me. And the last one that I think really helped push us forward was kind of researching the county budget and knowing what they're spending on uh, landfilling on if that's a, a revenue generating uh, program or if it's not and where the expense is, uh, exactly how much they're paying to transport that material out of state. Uh, so when I pitch things to the community, currently we're trying to go for a, a larger site. So as I pitch things to them, I, I'm educated with those numbers on how, many, how much avoided cost we did last year and how much avoided landfill cost we have this year. Uh, my my program brings, even though we don't have a partnership with the municipality, it brings our municipality some benefit because there is avoided landfill costs. And I know those numbers and uh, that, that helps a lot in gaining trust, but also, uh, you know, kind of buy in from the local community. Yeah, uh, Phil. Thank, I'm going to yeah, cut you off so we good. can move on, but I think you probably have a lot to say. Thank you. Zoning, that is such an important thing to focus on. And I know you said being educated on this is quite easy, but mandatory. And I'm sure nothing about this was easy for you. So um, so let's so hold your thoughts and questions. And, and Phil, if you can think about, too, uh, what you what would be most useful tools for you to address any ongoing challenges um, during the discussion. Maybe we can tease that out a little bit more. So Sarah, we're going to move on to Sarah Boltwana Messina at Anika Small Earth. So Sarah, um, Nick, if you could unmute Sarah, that would be great. Hi there. Can All right. We, yes, we can. Good. Okay, so uh, I'll just give a quick overview of uh, food to soil. So um, I am with Inika Small Earth, which is the nonprofit, and the nonprofit launched Food to Soil, which is a um, uh, social uh, enterprise inspired uh, program. Uh, we've set ourselves up as a collective of uh, restaurants, individuals, uh, community gardens. And we strive to collect food scraps from the neighborhoods, process it at community gardens that are in the neighborhood. Uh, and then the finished compost is either given back to our members as their uh, incentive, as their quarterly incentive, um, and also sold to, um, to urban gardeners uh, through our uh, exclusive partnership with the nursery that we have um, because most of our members live in apartment complexes and they don't really have use for the finished compost they just want a service that will compost their food scraps uh, we, we set ourselves up as uh, in hyper local loops um, we are a social enterprise so we charge for our uh, program and that's where we ran into trouble with the city of san diego uh, because the city wouldn't allow us to charge for our service. They were okay if we picked up the food scraps from restaurants uh, for free, but uh, they, had, they, they wouldn't allow us to charge uh, for that service. And um, after a year-long um, uh, year period of working with them, educating our uh, city council, working with the environmental services department, we were able to educate them on the value we were adding, that we were not a threat to the haulers, um, that we were providing a service that the haulers uh, would not be able to really provide. Uh, and then we were able to carve out uh, a space for us to operate. Um, so we charge our restaurants, we offer a drop-off membership for individuals uh, where they bring their scraps to us uh, and we sell our finished compost through the nursery. So these are our three main revenue streams. Uh, and the long-term goal with Food to Soil is uh, to really make it, to fine-tune it, make it, make it stand um, uh, make it stand on its two feet financially so that it's you know financially stable 
um, and then probably just you know carve it out as its own entity um, and also think about scalability so that other counties and other cities in California can um, can adopt the food to soil model. Um, so I'll leave my um, uh, introduction at this, Brenda. I'm happy to take questions on policy uh, from participants at a later time, unless you want me to touch on a specific policy uh, issue. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, if you could just quickly summarize, you know, um, how you, you know, how you over. I think I I don't know if you could see, but um, when Courtney had the slide up for food to soil, she mentioned that there were four things on there that I think you were able to overcome um, the exemptions for the for the small scale operators. There was a zoning application there was a labeling on the product and there was a hauling issue. So maybe that's a lot. You could pick one of them uh, or the biggest challenge and think and and how you solved it. But um, I yeah. think you've had some successes. So, yeah, I think people, we want to hear about that. OK, so uh, like I explained, the, the hauling largely was, uh, you know, haulers were not comfortable with uh, having a competitor enter their space and charge for uh, something that they have an exclusive right on because waste belongs to the haulers. And here there is this um, this little uh, team of composters with their buckets <laughs> collecting their scraps and then charging uh, for it. Uh, so they were not comfortable with it. Uh, the city was also not comfortable because, uh, unfortunately, cities receive, one way or another, there is a financial interest for cities uh, uh, to protect uh, hauler interests because they receive um, revenues, tonnage fees, revenues, recycling uh, and, uh, enterprise funds, whatever it is, there is a certain revenue stream that the government or the city receives. Um, uh, through the operations of the waste haulers. Um, so the hauling uh, compromise was that we would not go beyond a thousand tons a year, which in my mind is plenty of room for community scale composters. Um, so that's one threshold we accepted, we imposed on ourselves that we would not go beyond a thousand tons. Uh, in return, we got classified or we got the certification of um, it's called the certified recycling materials collector uh, so now we are a crmc and that allows us to collect and transport vegetative food scraps only so that's the other restriction that the city imposed on us which is that we could not collect non-vegetative food scraps um, because we compost in community gardens, um, we had Im self imposed that restriction on us, even when we started and we were operating in the gray area that we would only collect vegetative food scraps. So that was no biggie, really. Um, and um, uh, we are, and in terms of zoning, what the city did, which, which was very interesting, was they actually said that anyone can compost on any vacant land, on any urban, on any private property, as long as they are um, uh, composting vegetative food scraps and they're meeting the state requirements. So, so state of California um, restricts um, or, or provides an exemption uh, up to 100 cubic yards and a footprint of 750 square feet. So as long as you were meeting those uh, thresholds of being under 100 cubic yards and having a footprint of less than 750 square feet, uh, and then um, also abiding by the city imposed um, requirement that you were collecting only vegetative food scraps, you could compost anywhere in the city on any parcel, uh, irrespective of what it was zoned for, the owner, the landowner, just had to provide an acknowledgement letter that they were aware that vegetative food scraps were being composted on their property. So this I found was very, um, it was a very elegant solution um, to make room for us. Um, and then this, there are some restrictions on uh, selling finished compost, and that's really imposed by the state. Um, it, it's actually the the you. Um, the CDFA, the California Department for Food and Agriculture, which oversees the sale of compost, fertilizer, soil amendments. Um, we don't really have, we, I think we're still in a gray area there, but we have enough confidence and enough um, 
um, enough, um, I would say like, you know, with, with, the, with the email exchanges and stuff, I think we have enough confidence to be able to say that they're okay with us selling the finished compost. Um, the, the problem is that CDFA doesn't really have a category for compost. It's just lumped in somewhere, sometimes under packaged soil amendments and sometimes um, as a bulk item. Um, and so we've just been able to have this exclusive partnership with a nursery um, uh, that allows us to sell this compost. What we do is we provide uh, the compost in bulk. Uh, the definition of CDFA, uh, CDFA's definition for bulk is anything that is 110 pounds or more. So because we are providing our compost uh, to the nursery in these bulk quantities, um, we don't require registration, uh, licensing, and labeling. Uh, and so as long as we keep doing that, we're not, we're not after packaging because, you know, we are selling, uh, la um, uh, compost, which is, which is, which is a living material. And so, you know, it, it just has a lot of life in it and, and we're not really interested in sterilizing it. So we would not bag it. Uh, and so we're just providing this in bulk and uh, it's actually the fastest selling item uh, in the in that nursery. I get a call every week from the nursery saying, we're out of compost, can you drop some off? And and it's just, it's it's getting to a point where it's like, I just wish the microbes would work faster because just, it's just the, the, the curing has to happen um, and keep in sync with the demand uh, that we have. So, you know, there is something to be said for craft compost. Yeah, great, Sarah. Perfect. So um, what a great story. So um, hold your questions and comments on the what you've heard so far. Let's just wrap up with uh, Java Bradley at Java's Compost and then and then sh and Java has a few slides as does Matt, his pro bono lawyer. So um, as we're Java, unmute and uh, take it away. OK, how you doing? Um, Good. Uh, so my name is Java. OK, good. Um, so um, my name is Java and uh, my wife and I own a uh, what's become a backyard composting service called Java's Compost. And um, so what we do is we simply help redirect people's uh, organic waste. We help them to redirect the organic waste by turning it into compost in their own backyards. Um, and uh, I think, um, let's see, I guess well, we're located in New Jersey in Essex County. And we are uh, probably about 20 minutes, 25 minutes outside of New York City. And um, you know, we live in a suburban environment and most of our uh, residential customers are um, also in, in some uh, suburban environment, although we've serviced uh, people um, in a variety of the towns in, in, uh, in about five or six different towns in um, Essex County. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So uh, we started out, though, we wanted to haul. Um, that was our, our, our desire, to haul and, and also um, to make the compost. And we had this idea, you know, years ago um, in a kind of uh, in its uh, infant, infancy to um, process the material on a local community garden. And we were members of a community garden in one of the towns here in Essex County. Um, and we had this idea that we might go door to door. We thought it was actually, believe it or not, we thought it was a novel idea. We hadn't heard of, you know, compost pickup services or anything like that at the time. And uh, we thought we would go door to door. And for a small fee, we would, we would you know, pick up people's uh, kitchen waste and bring it to the two or three local community gardens in the area, process it, and then, um, the finished material would be donated to uh, the community gardens that we were using to process the material at. That was the, the model. Uh, we pitched it to the uh, board of the local community garden and they really liked the idea, but they had some reluctance. They, they had some concern, concerns. What if, you know, there was some health issue, nothing concrete. They couldn't put their finger on anything. I think they were just afraid of, you know, the potential um, legal uh, ramifications if somebody made a complaint. And, um, but, you know, when we talk face to face, they, the, the people on the board really liked the idea. So um, we decided to uh, 
you know, revisit the idea a, a, a year or two later, and we decided we wanted to do the same thing. And this time, again, obviously, we were not very, very well educated about uh, policies and ordinances and so on. We thought, oh, well, we'll just do it in our own backyard. We'll do the same idea. We'll, we'll go around door to door and collect people's, you know, uh, food scraps. We'll bring it to our backyard, which that, by that time we had a, a, a large area we could, we could um, process the material in. And um, and then we would perhaps uh, sell the material at the at at the end of the of the process. So we started doing a lot of research and very uh, very quickly discovered that that was not going to be allowed. So um, what we dis- what we found, um, as most of it you know most of you know, is that there were some policies about uh, I guess they called it here third party organics, and so you couldn't take one person's uh, food scraps and cross property lines. And uh, so we couldn't p- bring anything to our, our residents. And the other piece is that we discovered, well, there's a whole licensing and certify- certification process that you, we would need to go through. We'd also need to have a site. So all of these things together combined, uh, and, and the site would have been you know, uh, pretty expensive. So um, this is kind of the reality stage we realized that, okay, this is not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to manage this either. We can't purchase a site. Um, we can't afford the certification process. We can't afford the licensing process. Uh, so what are we going to do? So th- that's because of the regulations um, that we were learning about as we were doing our research for the business, um, we had to kind of uh, reinvent our, our dream. And so w- that's how we decided on this backyard composting service where we would, in order to um, abide by the regulations, we would um, sell a tumbler and then we would start people with these kind of uh, startup kits. And uh, if you could, uh, maybe you can go to the next slide as, um, uh, and so the, and the, it, the tumbler consists, uh, you know, it was a, 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 a metal insulated tumbler that we used. Uh, they'd get a, a bucket, a five gallon bucket, and so we would do one of two things. We would have either a DIY service where we would set you up and take you, you know, through the ABCs of handling the, you know, the material yourself and, you know, leave you with some material on troubleshooting and issues. And then we would offer support, ongoing support as one of our services um, for people who wanted to communicate digitally or, you know, needed a site visit to manage some issue. And then we'd also do a full service. And the full service um, was where we basically uh, functioned like a, a, a hauling service where we would come to your door. We, you know, leave you a clean bucket. We'd take your five gallon bucket filled up over the course of the week and we would bring it around back. But again, to abide by all the regulations, we process everything on the, the property of the, um, the owners of the tumbler. And so, it ended up so far, you know, we're still kind of in that state phase of um, we're still servicing people as residential co- uh, backyard composters. Um, and, you know, but we, what we found is um, you can still generate a lot of material. You can s- redirect a lot of material, but obviously a much more small scale than we would have otherwise been able to do if we were in a position to have a, a more community scale um composting service. So we've helped probably about 50, a little over 50 people to get started on with a DIY kind of starter kits. We're helping, uh, um, uh, we currently have 13 customers that are either all the way set up or in the process of being set up with a weekly full service. And so, you know, it ends up being, you know, each customer potentially is uh, probably uh, you know, capable of processing over a thousand pounds of food scraps at least. And so it can make a pretty significant impact. And so we're, we're kind of committed at the moment to trying to work within the confines of uh, the available resources that we have at our disposal, but also um, the regulations. And so that's kind of what, what is, is focusing us now. Um, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? Now, um, so 
as I was saying, so we probably, you know, the impact perhaps is not is not nearly as 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 big as a community compost, a community scale compost effort. Uh, where if we had a site and licensing and certification and and so on, but um, just with a small little pool of people that we've been able to service, the capacity has been you know relatively um, significant. And our you know plus about forty to sixty thousand pounds of food scraps have been redirected um, from uh, from local landfills or incinerators. And uh, and what we've discovered over this time is because we've continued to um, entertain the the idea of of um, pursuing uh, you know a, a site where we can process at a, at a very small scale um, uh, com, you know uh, like a hauling service uh, we found that there's just there's there is um, there's a lot of capacity and, and it actually would save the municipalities uh, the local towns um, a, a quite a bit of money um, if you look at the for example the the second um, bullet point um, in just in Essex County alone, there's 800,000 uh, residents, 120,000 single family homes. Current tipping fees for landfills are $90 per ton. So if you're just talking about the 120,000 um, single residences with an average of three people uh, per residence, and from our personal experience, uh, an average of about four pounds of food waste per person per week, you end up uh, with a savings of over $3 million for Essex County. Now, if you average into over uh, 800,000 actual residents, then you're going over $7 million. And again, I understand um, these are very simple numbers and there's a lot more I'm sure that goes into the whole infrastructure of uh, waste hauling that I'm missing here. But um, one of the things that we're hoping to um, uh, show uh, local towns is that the benefit of both a, a backyard composting initiative and also in partnership with a, a hauling um, a hauling service can can provide a huge savings for local towns and uh, and also uh, just an incredible uh, environmental benefit uh, to all the you know all the residents here. Um, so I think you know that's about it um, and. Uh, I guess uh, we still, as I said, we're still really uh, hoping to explore the idea of being able to get uh, get a site, and we're working with Matt on uh, something to mention uh, a little bit more in detail about a, a, an exemption that we're applying for, and um, and we're we're hoping to uh, we're hoping for the best in that initiative as well. Uh, thanks, Java. So Matt, on to you, and and Nick. I think Matt has a few slides too. Yes, I'll introduce myself while they're coming up. Um, my name is Matt Carmel. I'm an environmental attorney in New Jersey. And as Java said, um, there is, we can go to the, ne uh, the next slide. Everyone will hear the title from my description. So the, one of the issues that Java talked about and that you've heard about other times is that states have permitting requirements. I mean, New Jersey is uh, one of those states. So at the state level, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has a permitting requirement for any recycling activities, including composting. Um, there are certain exceptions, but um, as we'll get into, they're not always as broad as we'd like. Um, the process for obtaining a solid waste permit is time consuming. You have to get a local approval. You have to turn that local approval into a different local approval. And then you have to take both of those local approvals to the state and get the permit. And then you still have tens of thousands of dollars in compliance costs every year. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So New Jersey flat out does not regulate backyard composting. They have a manual describing their policy. So on-site residential composting, New Jersey does not regulate. Local governments may have zoning requirements and those sorts of things, but there is no permitting requirement from the state. Um, and the, the flip side of that is that um, composting in a community garden is is allowed but only if you only use the materials that are on site so at the moment that you bring a material off site onto the community garden to compost you, you require a permit pursuant to the state rules uh, next page 
So uh, New Jersey, this is a, what we're talking about now is a, is a regulation. And as you heard earlier during Courtney's description of, of different laws, there are different levels. There's local, there's administrative or regulatory, and then there's state and federal legislation. Um, so, so regulations in New Jersey can be changed by what's called a petition. Um, and it's a petition for rulemaking. And really what you do is you send a letter to the applicable government agency and you ask them to change to change some rule, same, change some regulation. And they have a certain specified set t- period of time set forth in a statute in which to review your request, publish it to the public for public comment, and then act on your request. Accept it, reject it, further consideration, all those different options. Uh, so, so with the help of Java's Compost, uh, we're representing Planting Seeds of Hope, which is a nonprofit that is asking the DEP uh, for uh, food waste outside of a community garden to be able to be brought under the state regulations and without a permit to the community garden for composting. So the next page. So the exemption is based on size. So the proposal is to allow a small area of the community garden to be utilized for composting of food waste. The activity would still be subject to general principles of the health health and safety laws. You wouldn't have specific requirements where you had to design it in a certain way or use a certain technology or or do do very specific activities which are included in the general permit regulations. But you would have a more holistic obligation to conduct the activity in a safe and appropriate manner. Um, And I should note that one of the things that we're hoping is that this will be the beginning of a discussion in New Jersey. New Jersey has, and the the New Jersey DEP especially, has a planning process that's ongoing right now where they're soliciting comments on food waste reduction. They're looking to put together a plan at the state level to help reduce food waste by a significant amount in the near future. So we view this as as sort of a a kickoff um, to that that whole process. Uh, Next. And so I've I've listed just a couple other issues that we've come across, which are local government approvals, air permitting, and sale or distribution of compost. I'll just say very broadly about all of these things. One of the problems that we have in New Jersey is that there is a lot of ambiguity uh, and it's not clear where things fit. There are a couple different laws that regulate sale and and distribution of compost in New Jersey and my read of them is that it's it's really hard for a layperson and even for me as a lawyer to look at that statute and say do I fit do I not fit and air permitting I think is the same thing. There There are exemptions, there are applicability provisions and it's really hard to read them because I don't think that they were drafted with community composting in mind or with composting in mind in general. So it, it's going to be a process to get to get the laws that are on the books in New Jersey to be reformed so that they work for community composting and for composting. But thankfully, there there are processes ongoing, both voluntarily with the agencies and that can be initiated by stakeholders, as I've described here. So thank you very much. I just wanted to give that. Yeah, thank you, Matt and Java. So if you have thoughts, just please reach out to us. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Uh, Most everybody stayed on to the end. So thank you. And we look forward to connecting with you. And by all means, please follow up um, if you have anything you want to discuss with us.